But now it's time to invite our first speaker today. And he is uh, he's on link from Ireland. And our first speaker is Michal Ubrin. And he is now retired, as I understand. But he is a former senior expert and uh, deputy head of nature unit in DG Environment in the European Commission. And Michal will uh, tell us about how was it intended and how does the EU think today. And we look very much forward to hear Michal's reflection on this. So, Michal, very welcome to take the scene here in Uppsala. And uh, it's a lot of people eager to listen to your presentation. So, Michal, welcome. We will see if we have... Oh, there, there is Michel. <laughs> good morning, Eva, and good morning, everybody in Uppsala. Um, it's a great honor to be able to, to join you, even remotely. I, I, um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, I certainly am very pleased to see that you're taking this topic as part of Sweden being in the presidency of the European Union at the moment and dealing with an important issue. Mm. I spent uh, 30 years working in the European Commission on Nature and Biodiversity Policy. After the Habitat Directive was adopted in 1992, the European Commission adopted me and I only retired uh, about a year ago. However, I speak today in a personal capacity, but I would hope that my experience and knowledge of the policy, the Habitats and Birds Directive, uh, will be of interest to you. Um, I would like to say a few words about the origins, the context in which the legislation came about and their objectives, and then obviously to explore the implementation, the performance of the directives, and then of course to try and place them in the context of the 2030 biodiversity mm -hmm. policy. And can I see the slides? Uh, I'm fortunately, um, if we could move to the first slide. Uh, the next slide, please, yes. Mm -hmm. see. Um, well, I think the first thing to recall is, you know, Homo sapiens, our species has probably been on this planet for about 250 to 300, uh, 350,000 years. And we've had a big impact on all the other species living on this planet. But probably only in the last 60 years has there been a global awareness of that impact and the need for us to have a, a more balanced approach towards our relationship with nature. I would say that Rachel Carson's publication in 1962, Silent Spring, was an inspiration to the environmental movement which grew from then. The first big global gathering at a political level took place in Stockholm in Sweden over 50 years ago, when the first Earth Summit put environment sustainable development on the global political agenda. The European Union, or as it is today, the European Union responded when heads of state and government gathered in Paris later that year, and they decided that the environment was going to be part of the EU agenda. And that gave birth to the first Environment Action Programme and also, in turn, to the BIRDS Directive in 1979. Move forward 20 years, and then we had the second, event, that huge event that took place in Rio de Janeiro, which gave birth to really important conventions like climate change and desertification, and of course, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is the overarching global framework on biodiversity. And in preparation for that, the European Union also committed itself to a new piece of legislation, the Habitats Directive. Next slide, please. And I think it's important to remind ourselves of the context in which this nature legislation came about. Because even into the 1970s, it was extremely apparent that there had been serious loss of nature and species during the 20th century. 
most obvious for birds, we had seen species like the birds of prey, the peregrine falcon, collapse as a response to um, the use of DDT and all these uh, pesticides. There was also evidence of major large-scale habitat loss, particularly of wetlands, where big drainage programs, frequently supported by agriculture, had led to uh, a loss of habitat. We had pollution, we had pressures from unsustainable use, particularly of issues such as hunting and trapping in southern European countries. And what's so clear was there was much difference between the different nature laws in countries and it was a great case to be made in terms of more harmonised approaches. Now, of course, the one of the great triggers, and this gave birth to the birds directive, was this concept of shared natural heritage, that the birds that you have in Sweden are also birds shared with France and Spain, for example, the, the cranes that nest in Sweden, and therefore we had to look after them and work together. Next slide, please. So th the two directives have broadly similar objectives. The birds directive is a framework directive for all wild birds that naturally occur in the European Union. And its overall objective is to achieve good, healthy populations having regard to the socioeconomic context in which it operates. The habitats directive focused on species and habitats which were deemed to be of European conservation concern. It was very innovative in focusing on habitat conservation for the first time, broadening the scope beyond species. And it introduced the concept of favorable conservation status, which I think was a clearer concept than in the BIRDS directive. However, the two directives have four similar pillars, first being in relation to site protection, the Natura 2000 network. The pillar of habitat and landscape conservation, then there is the stable and species protection, and of course, and the one on knowledge, data availability, and awareness. And I'd like to say a little about each of them. Next slide, please. I couldn't, could I have the next? Yeah, thank you. Um, of course, when we look at the implementation, we need to be clear as to what we are using as evidence. The state of nature assessments are the key source of periodic evaluations of implementation, looking at progress in achieving conservation goals. There are many other very important sources of information, citizen science schemes, like the one of the European Bird uh, Census Council on bird monitoring in Europe, uh, the Natura 2000 barometer developed by the European Commission and the European Environment Agency looked at progress on setting up Natura 2000. There's a, a, an extraordinary rich source of information now from peer-reviewed scientific publications and also great studies that have been done in, in the grey literature in terms of looking at the implementation of different aspects. There have been review conferences and workshops. I would single out the European Court of playing a pivotal implementation in terms of giving a clear um, standards in terms of assessing performance of member states. And of course, we did a very large scale evaluation, um, the Nature Directive Fitness Check, which was published at the end of 2016. And I was privileged to coordinate that exercise. And that was a very sensitive exercise. Many of you will know there was a sense that the directives were, were actually at risk and it gave birth to a nature alert campaign. But thankfully, it was recognised that the directives were fit for purpose. Um, next slide, please. So if we look at the first pillar, the most, I'd say, significant achievement of the directives has been in setting up this network of areas of high biodiversity value. It was very slow in starting, despite the time frame set out in the Habitats Directive. But I think with the aid of the European Environment Agency, its topic centre, the fact that the European Commission set up a mechanism to bring member states from each of the nine biogeographic regions together into the same room. So we discussed the contributions of each country. And sometimes that led to very interesting outcomes, 
where one member state, not only the European Commission saying you have to do more, but one uh, member state telling another that really they had to actually improve um, their performance. So that was a peer review exercise, which was very valuable. We also had important improvements in NICH, for example, on the BIRDS Directive, the scientific reference to the important bird areas, which the BIRDS Directive gave, gave rise to, also helped improve the recognition of what needed to be done. Life Nature, the, the EU fund, also supported inventories in different countries, both for the terrestrial and the marine environment. We also recognised early in the process that it wasn't only for the member state authorities and the scientific NGOs to be in the room. We had to bring in the stakeholders, the agriculture, the forestry, the fishers, but to do so exclusively from a scientific contribution because this was a scientific exercise. Even though the marine environment was less well represented in the Habitats Directive in terms of habitats and species, we recognised we needed more guidance and that was actually something that was developed in partnership with the member states. And again, going back to the Court of Justice, we recognise the importance of having um, the enforcement where some countries were not actually doing their, their, their job. Um, and then the, ultimately at the end, there was even a threat to block the use of funds and in terms of EU funds that should not be used to damage areas that member states were failing to propose for protection. And that was actually invoked in the case of Wallonie in Belgium. So now we have the largest coordinated multinational network on the planet, over 27,000 sites, one fifth of the land, one tenth of the marine environment. So it's an extraordinary achievement of Sweden and all the other countries working together. It's still not complete. There are some gaps for the marine, but the big challenge, of course, is to make sure that these are not paper parks, that they are actually functioning sites effectively managed. Next slide, please. Of course, the other critical issue was in terms of the socioeconomics, how you would actually reconcile conservation of these important areas with the socioeconomic context. Um, and I think that required a lot of work in terms of developing guidance, um, sorry, can I have the next slide or can you see the next slide? Um, in terms of ensuring that gu guidance was available on the provisions of Article 6 of the Habitats Directive. And that was a very important piece of, of um, work in terms of producing guidance to show that there was flexibility set out in the directives to allow for um, economic developments where this was justified, but you needed to follow good procedures in relation to the, um, the, the, the directive. And of course, we also developed sectoral specific guidance, including for issues like forestry, which I know is a sensitive issue in relation um, to countries like uh, Sweden. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide, yeah. I think this is the next one, please, yeah. Um, and then, of course, the issue of financing was hugely significant in terms of implementation, um, because my view, and I think of colleagues, is that if conservation without money is simply conversation, you need the resources, the financial capacities, the human capacities, in order to be able to promote a significant agenda of management and restoration. And now we're talking for natural and related green infrastructure. It takes about 10 billion euros or more on an annual basis. And that's a very significant amount of investment uh, needs. Life, the EU dedicated nature fund is a very important and strategic fund, but it's only a small fund relative to the overall EU budget. And the strategic nature projects which now are being developed will hopefully give it a greater catalytic effect. But the general approach that was agreed was that nature financing was to be achieved through integration into the other big funds, the common agriculture policy being probably the most notable example. Unfortunately, we don't have earmarking of funds in those for nature funds in those big funds, and that has always presented a problem. The European Commission with the member states tried to help by promoting the development of prioritized action frameworks, 
which are planning tools setting out strategically what needs to be done, identifying priorities and trying to match them with the different funding instruments. Um, but my sense is we're not there yet. We still need to strengthen the capacity for financial investment in nature and its restoration. And of course, that's very relevant in the context of the new nature restoration law. Next slide, please. And the other thing very briefly is that there is another pillar beyond the sites in terms of habitat conservation on land and in the marine environment. And this probably is a provision that hasn't been fully exploited in the context of the directive. There's limited uh, jurisprudence. There was one case we took against Ireland on overgrazing um, and the red grouse, which showed the potential of Article 3 of the birds directive. But it's a, it's, a, it's a delicate issue in terms of dealing with planning. It deals with integration in other policies. It also links to other environmental pieces of legislation like the Water Framework Directive. Um, some member states have developed this concept of ecological connectivity beyond the sites. But I don't think we're successful in terms of dealing with the wider landscape. And we can see this in terms of, for example, the fate of common birds in the farmland and um, where we can see that continuing decline takes place. And I think more needs to be done there. Next slide, please. I think we've made more successful when it comes to the species protection provisions. And I think the directives have set a standard across all countries in relation to species protection and dealing with sustainable use. And this has been more, most successful on issues such as dealing with commercialization, trade in species, even if some illegal activities continue. We've been most successful in targeting this on the most endangered species, for example, the bird species, where species action plans have been developed with support from the European Commission, be they at EU or international level. And where you combine this with the life funds, you really do get the basis for good recovery of species. Um, hunting has definitely been the most sensitive issue under the birds directive. And following a court ruling that we had in the 1990s against France on the issue of protection during spring migration, where the court said it had to be complete during spring migration and also during reproduction, that led to a very polarized debate. And uh, we had to broker a better cooperation between bird life and face the European Hunters Federation, which Margaret Wallström, the then commissioner, or the Swedish commissioner at the time, actually and, and, and negotiated and we were successful in building a better environment. There are issues, of course, that continue in relation to the use of derogations, but probably the most controversial issue, and I'm sure you're very aware of it, next slide please, is dealing with conflict species, um, most notably the large carnivores. And I know that you will be very aware of the challenge of managing, conserving wolf populations in Sweden and in other countries where they are returning after long decades or centuries of persecution. And of course, developing and implementing a policy of coexistence while conserving wolves and recognizing the challenges, particularly with farmers of the um, living and um, compensating and supporting them in that is really an important element. Of course, there are other conflict species. The cormorant is the least loved species under the birds directive, I would say. There are challenges with the uh, goose populations that are expanding, like the barnacle goose, and there's cooperation with an international framework for that. But these debates continue, but the directives do provide a framework in relation to that. Next slide. And of course, the knowledge base underpinning, scientifically underpinning implementation is fundamental. And I think the directives have contributed to improving that um, through the state of nature assessments. They are not perfect, but they do represent the best body of European scale information on the status and trends of protected species and habitats. But we see from the last assessment published in 2020 that we really are still not yet successful in achieving the goals of the directive because I would argue that the pressures on nature are still too great
and implementation, unfortunately, has not been uh, strong enough. So we need to address knowledge gaps, particularly for the marine. I would argue we also need to strengthen our understanding of what we mean by favourable conservation status for species and habitats protected under the legislation. So the work on favourable reference value, and to, to the credit of Sweden, you have taken this more seriously than many other countries, is really important and we need to strengthen that. You need to strengthen that in Sweden um, as well as other countries, but um, that's a fundamentally important piece of work. And of course, um, we, we also need to actually have a better understanding of management effectiveness of the protected areas. Next slide, please. And we did a study a number of years back, looked at reporting of the, the implementation of the directive from the state of nature assessments and tried to identify the key success uh, ingredients, the drivers of success. And I think that, you know, fundamental to that is the political context in which they operate, the governance systems, that we have good institutions with motivated staff. So that's a fundamental element in terms of that. We need to ensure that the stakeholder communities um, are fully engaged, particularly at the local level. You need to have very good research and monitoring that is targeting to identify the ecological requirements of the species so that when investments are made, they are made in the right way so that we can actually ensure the most cost-effective solutions. <clears throat> you need access to funding. Um, the life fund I mentioned is really important, but it's, it has to be complemented by other public and private funding. And of course, we need to have the long-term sustainability of actions. It's not enough to restore. You need to maintain there afterwards. So if I could move on just finally to maybe saying a few words about the future, because I think that the directives do have a critical role. Next slide. Um, in terms of the 2030 agenda for um, biodiversity. If I could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> and I think that um, the nature legislation is central to implementation of the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. Um, if you look at just two examples, the protected area target for 2030 in the EU strategy is to expand our ambition for 30% of land and marine to be in protected areas, one third of which would be strictly protected. Um, and I think that the nature legislation and Natura 2000 combined with national protected areas will be central to delivering that. We also have a, an ambition to see real recovery of protected species and habitats, 30% of them to be showing real signs of improvement or achieving favourable status. And there is a process that has been set up with the member states um, looking for pledges. There will be seminars to see how this is done, and this will be a, an important piece of work in the ongoing uh, years. But without strong commitments for implementation, without good enforcement mechanisms, we will not succeed in relation to that. And I think we also have to recognize that the nature directives are really central to biodiversity and sustainable development policy, but they have to be combined with other areas of action in relation to the climate agenda, in relation to the food um, debate on farm to fork, and also in relation to, for example, issues such as the circular economy, because ultimately it's about how we, we live in a sustainable way. And my final comments, if I could move on to the next slide, please, um, is, no, just back one, please, yes. And that's just to say a word about the new nature restoration law that has been proposed. And I think this will be a fundamentally important addition to the EU framework for biodiversity conservation. Um, it will have great added value. And the evidence, I just saw this recent publication in the journal Nature looking at wetland loss globally, 
but taking examples from Europe since 1700. And you can see in the 20th century just how much we have lost. Unfortunately, the country I'm living in is at the bottom of the table there. Um, I presume Sweden is somewhere at the lower end as well. Um, but it just shows you what the significance of the challenge is in relation to restoration. The birds in the habitats directives, our existing legislation, have a fundamentally important role to play, including in restoring sites in the Natural 2000 network. But there are some weaknesses in relation to what we can achieve, one of which is the directives have not got a time frame for delivery. And I think the new nature restoration law will provide a major impetus for implementation by setting clear timeframes, by setting clear goals and providing mechanisms like, for example, the national plans, so that we will actually have a greater enabling environment. They will also have a wider scope than what we cover in the birds and habitats directive, so there will be complementarity there as well. And of course, they will also provide opportunities to join up with the climate agenda because the biodiversity and climate crisis will have to be dealt with together. So I would hope that you in Sweden, during your presidency, will do everything possible to further this goal of adopting this law so that we can move forward in Europe on a more purposeful um, nature uh, restoration agenda. So uh, last slide, please. And that's just a short overview um, of the nature legislation in the context of where we are on biodiversity policy. I will finish from a nice picture I took in Abisko many years ago during the last Swedish presidency. I was very fortunate to visit your beautiful country there. And I wish you success during your conference on the many issues that you're going to be debated over the, the next period. Um, so thank you for listening to me. Uh, and, you know, me and Mark, we were also in Arbisco and took very nice pictures at the same time you were there. Uh, we have already some questions for you, so I ask Mark to come. Mark, heter du? <laughs> I start to pronounce Mark's name in English. Uh, I don't know why. Um, so, we have several <coughs> questions. Could you pick one? Yes. Uh yeah, we do. We have a couple of questions about compliance. Um, there are quite a few examples that it, compliance is hard. Uh, we are still cutting uh, primary forests, is, is an example. Um, <coughs> why is it so hard to comply with the nature directives? They have been around for a long time, and biodiversity loss is still ongoing. Um. Mark, a, a very good question and, and lovely to see you. Mark worked with us for a year in the European Commission, but I think Eva stole him back to Sweden. So I forgive you, Eva, um, <laughs> in relation to this. It's no, the issue of compliance is, is, is fundamental. And the European Commission's policy has always been to promote compliance, working with stakeholders, trying to explain, producing guidance. But Enforcement has a role to play as well. And I think we probably have not been good enough in terms of combining those tools for both a proactive way and a, a, um, a, an enforcement way. Because at the end of the day, the directives represent a body of law. So if you have old growth forest, um, it's, 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 it's very hard to understand how... Particularly, well, if it's in a protected area, it should not happen unless it is justified under Article 6. Outside of that, there should be very serious consideration of whether it's necessary. And the provisions for the wider landscape are not as strong. But if, for example, we have large-scale loss of nature, high-value nature outside Nature 2000, really, you have to explore new mechanisms to actually ensure. And maybe the new agenda for 2030 where more protected areas, the old growth forest has been singled out as a critical concern in Europe, not only in Sweden, but also in places like Romania, where there are still large areas of old growth forest. So 
I think you need to explore these issues. The directives are a tool, but you need to other use other mechanisms as well, other environment legislation. Yes. We Would have you more? say that the EU or the Commission, the EU, is checking the implementation and the compliance in an effective way, or could it be improved? <clears throat> yeah, it's a very good question. And of course, we, we do regularly, we, we set up bilateral discussions with each of the countries as part of the follow-up to the fitness check, where we had dedicated meetings involving the stakeholders, the NGOs, involving the authorities and other stakeholders as well, to look at all the implementation challenges. We do respond to complaints from NGOs, from citizens, and, ex and examine them based on scientific and other evidence. So the Commission certainly has taken the matter seriously, but can only look at issues for which it has good, strong evidence. Because when we go to the court, the burden of proof is on the Commission to prove the country is not complying, rather than for the country to prove that it is. So, yes, we could be smarter, but I think the Commission has done a huge amount of work. And the court, as I said, in Luxembourg, really has played a pivotal role. There are some important rulings on the uh, coming forward on the issue of management of Natura 2000. There is a court ruling imminent against Ireland on the issue of conservation measures for Natura 2000 sites, which will also be relevant to countries like Sweden. So I, I would advise you to, to, to look carefully at that ruling when it comes out. You have one more question? I have a lot, but, uh, <laughs> or you, you have a lot. Um, but I would like to ask one maybe dual question. It's, it's about uh, updating. Uh, the directives have been in place for quite a while now, and nature has developed. Uh, we have examples <coughs> for swans and cranes, geese, uh, whose populations have grown. So would it be time to update the annexes? And, and the other question about updating, uh, is there any process for updating the Natura 2000 areas or the Natura 2000 network? And how does that work? That's a very good question, Mark. And I had a slide included in earlier, but I didn't have enough time to go into the issue of adopting the annexes. They have been changed for each enlargement. There was a change in 1997, after Sweden joined with, uh, to actually adopt the annexes for the boreal region. Um, but you're right, they have not been adapted in the last uh, years, for the last 20 years. There are risks. If the Commission tomorrow was to propose to um, open up the directives for amending the annexes, that opens up the whole directives. You can't actually ring fence the debate on the annexes. So probably because during a certain period, there was a perception that the directives if opened up would be weakened, that there was no great appetite for doing that. But maybe as we move forward, there should be a case made for a scientific reflection on looking at the annexes. The Commission and the European Environment Agency has done preparatory work for that for when that moment takes place. But let's try and make sure that it's a focused scientific debate. Ideally, it would be a ring fence debate because, you know, once the day we actually have a, a, a proposal to amend the annexes, there will be certain interest groups that will say, let's amend all the actual uh, other provisions of the directives as well. So yes, it needs to be done. Preparatory work has been made. And maybe Sweden and other countries should bring this to the table in the future uh, with a view to a really useful scientific updating analysis. And we need to be extra careful when talking about updating the annexes for Natura, because reconfiguring the network is, um, you know, it's a very delicate point. It is critical space for nature, even if the interest features change. And given the 30% ambition for 2030, we should be expanding protected areas, not reducing them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michel. This was the last question for this session. And uh, so we say very much thank you to your overflight over this very complex area.
And uh, so thank you again. And uh, now we will have a coffee break. So I will turn into Swedish again. So bye and thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much. And I wish you success. And I